Can I start? Uh, we have uh, many people uh, waiting to hear uh, our uh, expert, Anne Sophie, with her new webinars. Um, you know, seven months ago, I was actually on vacation. I was in Punta Cana with my, uh, it happened, luckily, I was also with the CTO of Cognibox, my friend, and with our family, a drink, you know, having a margarita at the beach. And this crisis started in February. We started to hear about uh, the COVID and, you know, the potential impact on us as Canadians, because it was, as you know, a little bit earlier in other places. And who had said, like, seven months after this, seven, eight months, uh, we are still uh, actually in the crisis? Because I do remember I was sharing, as I said, um, at the hotel with Paul, my CTO, and we started to have some brainstorming, even with Anne Sophie and some member of the team at Cognibox about what can we do uh, as a health and safety organization, try to contribute and help our client, our organization. Uh, we started to discuss about uh, providing initially a first e-learning, uh, uh, you know, project or an e-learning content just to describe what is COVID and the impact. So imagine who, you know, never anyone thought that we would be still in this crisis. And we started to develop different uh, application and different solution to help our clients. And I still remember a lot of uh, comments, either from friends or even uh, clients saying, oh, George, there's no way that in six, seven months or whatever, we're gonna be still living in the same crisis. And uh, my reaction was always one event in September 11, 20 years ago, almost changed our life forever. It's been 20 years, one day, an unfortunate event, and we still take off our shoes, we still empty our bottles of water before we cross the borders or we go to the airport. And here again, we're sitting after seven months, and I truly believe, unfortunately, that this crisis is changing the way we gotta be doing business for many, many years. Uh, you know, uh, complacency is a very, very, very bad thing for businesses. And this is actually what happened initially. People thought that this is gonna disappear and we're not gonna hear about it. So for us, it's very important to really uh, be aware that you know changes has happened. And this is why we've been uh, actively working with our clients to try to educate them first about uh, this crisis and now trying to see how we can continue to contribute because our day-to-day -day has changed from a personal point of view and from a, a business point of view. Uh, before I uh, present uh, Anne-Sophie and uh, basically uh, let her discuss her webinar, Anne-Sophie, as you mostly, as most of you know, she already, this is already, I think this is her third or fourth webinar since this crisis. She's done excellent job with us, uh, trying to educate us through the crisis from the beginning, and I'm extremely happy uh, that we, she's going to share with us also more insights about how we manage uh, through uh, throughout this crisis. But one, uh, I'm going to leave you with one thought I was reading uh, a while ago when uh, a book about, um, about crisis, and they were interviewing this uh, army, general army in the U.S. during the Vietnam Wars, and they were in captivity, and they asked them, how did some of the... Uh, uh, soldiers survived and some did not survive the captivity and the answer of this general was the pessimist one survived because they were prepared for the wars and the optimist one did not. I don't want to be pessimist but I want to be realistic that our life has changed and that's why we've been actively working try to prepare for how we get our change our day-to-day -day in terms of business. So on that, I'd like to present Anne Sophie. Anne Sophie, she's our expert in health and safety and risk management. She's been a lot involved from the beginning, as I said, and uh, we're looking forward to hear her presentation. Uh, thank you and uh, good webinars. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you very much. So yes, indeed, here we are again, almost seven months after, um, but you know what? I think we hear everybody about the COVID fatigue, and um, indeed, <laughs> indeed, we are all fatigued about that. But wishful thinking is not enough to think that it's gone. It's not. And I want to show you uh, data to show what is the real situation and also how, you know, 
at the start, it was the problem of everybody. And in companies, well, guess what? We have the health and safety experts, which are there in life just for that, for managing uh, the risk, the not so good news. Uh, but so, um, but I think that we can uh, basically take up the challenge, and I will demonstrate. So, um, so I'm going to talk about so that that's my my context. But today I will talk more about why a management system approach, because this is the title of the presentation: adopting a management system approach to controlling COVID transmission in the workplace. And then after that, as you know, the challenge is. Um, executing the plan. Um, putting together great plans is something, but then uh, making them happen is another one. Um, so yes, so COVID, there's many aspects to it. And indeed, so today I'm going to focus about how we can manage this in the workplace. So um, funny thing is that seven months later, we would hope and we think that Everybody knows what to do. And not only us here this morning, I'm sure your kids, your mother, your everybody in society has uh, pretty much gotten the message that it should be simple. And, and I mean, you hear it all the time. It's not rocket science because uh, it's kind of a simple um, disease to control. To control the transmission, maybe not that simple to uh, cure and to uh, treat medically, but to uh, prevent the transmission, it's pretty simple. So once you know how it spreads, um, then the recommendations are to wash the hands often and uh, to avoid close contacts, cover your mouth and nose with a mask when around others, cover coughs and sneezes, clean and disinfect, and monitor your health daily. So Pretty much it's simple. We do know much better uh, since recently, finally, that in fact, um, aerosol dispersion is, um, is a problem. And in fact, the two meters of the start might require actually more. So the close contact uh, could be even uh, less close than we thought it would, but essentially it's pretty much always the same thing. Yet, if we look at, um, so that's the latest data as of this morning. So if we look at something reliable, which is the number of deaths, as opposed to the number of cases, which actually depends on how much, uh, um, uh, how much testing has been done in a country, but still we, we can see how things are not doing too well. So there has been the famous second wave that we see in, um, in Europe. So Spain, Italy, and all that, France are uh, hit quite hard. Uh, then you see us in North America and Canada, we're trending a little bit like Germany. So there is not such a dramatic increase, but still it is going up. And as we know, we are kind of, um, of in confinement again, sort of. But uh, so it does take effort to maintain this relatively slower slope of increase, but still one. And then you've got the USA, which have been just steadily climbing up and up and up. And I don't know when they will get the time to think more uh, about this. Maybe they'll finally get it under control a little bit more and, uh, and level off this uh, rate of increase. So in, um, in the jurisdiction where we are right now in, uh, in our province, it's quite interesting because um, so two weeks ago, the, um, the public, say, uh, public health has come up with the fact that, whoops, um, there is now, so just under half, so it's actually 46% of the outbreaks which are work-related. So we hear a lot about, about uh, clusters in old people, um, uh, housing, uh, about school, about restaurant, about all this. But in fact, the one single biggest area of transmission is in the workplace. So we'd like to think that this is all over and we can move on to greater things. But unfortunately, uh, right now, we still need to do our homework uh, in the workplace. And maybe it's time to get back to um, the drawing board and reassess and make sure we did everything correctly. So. And, and some of the things that I'm, that I'm thinking about is that, you know, like the, our simple rules, cover your mouth and nose uh, with a mask around others. You must be like me and it must drive you banana when you see uh, folks out there wearing their mask in, for example, those six um, unproductive fashion, which I'm sure you've seen. And also the people touching their uh, mask all the time. 
even during uh, interviews on TV, you can see some, uh, some people touching their mask as they're speaking. And they're representing actually governmental authorities. And you think, oh my God, it's, it's more complicated than you think to rewire a human brain to say wear the mask and if it doesn't cover your nose and mouth it's like if you, uh, and mouth it's like if you don't have it and if you keep on touching it well come on the coronavirus if it is out there is on your mask so why would you touch it so it's um it's really more complicated than it is and um, actually uh just in canada here we had at the start of the week public authorities saying hey you know what those masks homemade well you know what if they don't have three layers inside they're not that uh, um, that uh, that effective and they just came up with this but actually this was uh, uh the uh, uh, world world health organization has mentioned that back in the summer so in fact you wonder like oh my god they're treating us with a little bit at a time as not to give us all the bad news at once but in fact it is a problem and you could probably see that in most of the of the uh, stores and restaurants and things like that people were wearing fabric homemade masks but in fact the um, labor requirements so ministry different labor ministry like here in Quebec they're actually forbidden for the work side the workers have to wear surgical masks but about nobody actually implements all of that so it's um, it's tough for for that part and then when you think well this is like general population or people that are not necessarily expert at this but to me it's fab fabricasting when I'm looking at um, studies like this one um, amongst uh, the healthcare worker showing that the spread of um, uh, for controlling the spread of respiratory F infection as we know it's uh, respiratory hygiene but they found that even healthcare workers have quite a low um, a, lo a low compliance to to what they're supposed to do and what are the causes like tendency to forget discomfort that type of thing so imagine for the general public as we know and then for washing hands often we could see from the cdc they came up also with a study saying that healthcare providers clean their hands less than half of the time they should so if these guys don't do it what are the chances with the normal people like us so if you've seen those experiments also with the black light it's like okay like even now if people would think about washing their hands all the time you could see that without proper hand washing technique you're actually not even removing uh, the entire um, quantity we should say a virus that could be on your hand so um pretty depressing and um, so back as we said you know in April I had done the first webinar and I think at that time when I'm looking at the title it makes me uh, smile a bit because preparing to be first out of the gate when confinement is phased out well that was kind of a first phase out but of course we were kind of back there again but what I had uh, covered during that webinar is essentially the fact that if you put yourself back you know at the uh, at the start of April everything was all about PPEs and not enough masks and not enough gloves and not enough of all this. But so the whole focus was on the PPEs. Yet as uh, experts of health and safety, we know that, whoa, PPEs is the, your last line of defense. If you're using the hierarchy of control, you want to be eliminating at the source uh, the, the, the hazard. Then you want to use engineering controls and then uh, administrative uh, like training procedures and all that, and then you get to the PPEs. So how come the whole focus was on PPEs? So that was really puzzling to me. But then I was start starting to get a little bit reassured seeing that the supermarkets, grocery stores were starting to put plexiglass in. Uh, there was finally people installing uh, things not to have to open doors with your hands and things like that. So that was kind of a little bit uh, encouraging. And finally, um, there's been some people saying, hey, you know what? Let's Let's use the hierarchy of control. That's what we do in uh, health and safety. That's our unique way as health and safety professional to uh, to see the world. World. So that's an excellent article if you want to uh, Google it uh, that I recommend uh, reading for putting ourselves back into managing uh, the COVID pandemic in the workplace with our reference as health and safety professionals. So the the hierarchy of control, um, and then. The um, 
the, the, the administrative control, which is, okay, well, let's ask the people to follow a certain path when they're walking. Let's ask them to do things differently. As you know, all those uh, procedure and reorganization of the work, they're all based on the human beings wanting to do it and doing it correctly. So, as we said, um, it's it's not that great. So uh, they're not uh, um, they're not too effective, but they're quite easy to implement. They don't cost a lot of money, and um, but we have to know that it's something that you do for bridging a gap until more effective controls are in place. So um, personal protective equipment, as we said, so yes, they are at the bottom of the hierarchy, but there have been there have been a major focus because they're quick. They're quick to implement when they're available. And so their conclusion there was that, yes, okay, we did the PPEs, we were in a hurry, this thing came fast, but it's impor important to reassess. So what I want my message, one of the thing here is like, okay, uh, we think it was gonna be over, it's not it's time to reassess how we've been uh, managing the risk of transmission in our workplace. So even though probably all of your colleagues uh, are gonna say, oh no, not again, please, no, 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 I thought it was over, but no, it's time to reassess. And um, we, um, you, you, uh, you'll be able to do it with the hierarchy of control. I thought that this was so interesting when I saw that article in the Harvard Business Review. So it's like, okay, these guys are um, actually not health and safety experts, but they've got it exactly right. So they've put not only our our hierarchy, our pyramid of hierarchy of control that we love as OHS expert. Well, they have put it upside down. So, but that's a sign that it's a business review. But still, the important thing that they've put there, which is uh, pretty cool, is the business impact. So they really want to show that you know PPEs is great, but you know, um, it's not not such of a good effectiveness. But it's also uh, much cheaper to implement than doing the other things, basically like engineering control in place, healthy buildings. So making sure that there's um, sufficient movement of air in buildings, as you know, it's expensive. And for years, I'm an engineer by training. So for, for years, uh, what we've been trying to do is more energy efficiency of buildings and reducing actually uh, that type of thing. But now this is contrary to what we wanna do for uh, COVID control. So there's been finally uh, lots of, um, of different organizations that have come up with what to put in place in the, in the workplace following the hierarchy of measure. So this one was uh, pretty good in June. And then you see all kinds of different sources that have come up with this, but then I'm like, what? Why on earth would they put cleaning with wipes as an engineering control? So you've got to be a little bit... Uh, um, selective when using those sources, uh, but it's there now. Oh, sorry, my computer was slow reacting to to this. Uh, just a second. Okay, there. It wasn't going as fast as I wish it was going. Okay, so back to hear those studies with um, the people that are right in the uh, uh, business of um, of health. So uh, now on the on the hand hygiene. So one of the study did look at the causes of why there was such a low compliance with hand hygiene amongst health workers. So um, I'm going to show you this and as an um, expert of OH health and safety, you would know that you would use basically um, uh, the analysis of the cause and basically sort the cause, categorize them into the, uh, um, the, the categories that you can actually do an implementation on it of a solution. So if I'm looking at basically those five categories, so they've identified 24 issues in their article, they're all there like boom, but what I did is put them with some kind of affinity so we could see, well, what is it that we should be managing differently if we want to improve the compliance for hand hygiene? So, so the first ones of all their 24 categories are the ones that are, okay, the human imperfection. So you're asking humans to wash your hands more often and wash them well. Okay, so, you know, they had found that in the cause of why uh, they're not uh, compliant with hand hygiene, they forget, they're distracted. 
uh, they have a perception that, well, if they wear gloves, it's going to be um, as good as uh, cleaning hands. Uh, maybe we've trained them, but the uh, education didn't really last too long. Um, all, well, they should be reminding each other. They've got their perception and all that. So this is all the human imperfection. So any of your controls which are going to go after humans needing to do something, well, all of this is going to happen. Then in the maintaining replenishing, it's like, okay, well, you, we've provided you with a sink uh, or, and dispenser of soap and, uh, or, um, or disinfectant, but then it's broken. So things that are physical break um, or um, they need to be replenished. So yes, there's a dispenser, but now it's empty. And then, whoops, we didn't put the soap instead. Somebody made a mistake and it was the lotion. So all the maintaining and replenishment is another process that we'll have to address because it's not because you install it at once that it stays like this. No, things in life get broken and you need to replenish. Then other things is like, okay, well, great, there is soap, but it irritates the hands. So um, skin irritation, hand cleaning product feels unpleasant. Okay, I mean, is this annoying or not? You go in stores, you have to put disinfectant. And in some stores, I don't know where they get their disinfectant, but it's so uh, gleeky and um, I don't know what the word is, but you know what I mean? It's so sticky. And sometimes it stinks like hell. You wonder, my God, now in November, it's possible to find better ones. So is it was it just a question of price? Did they get the cheapest one? And then they didn't ask us if we like it. Well, that's a, that's a problem because then it's going to uh, be a deterrent for user to, um, to use it. And then after that, you've got everything like, okay, are, have we adapted the design to the workflow of the work that needs to get done? So yes, you have the hand rub, but if it's inconveniently placed, if it slows down your work process, if, uh, um, if uh, well, if the workflow is not conducive, uh, your hands are full because you're doing up something else, uh, there's special circumstances, there's all of these things which basically means like whoever installed those uh, those equipment that I need to do my hand washing, did anybody ask uh, how we work so we could see if this works well? So, um, so we've got all those things, so there's plenty of reasons for that. And then after that, what do we have? It's like, well, anyway, nobody checks. So no data collected. Uh, so basically, does anybody care? And then at the end, well, you know what? There's number nine here, inadequate safety culture. Yeah, because at the end of the day, when you see that a solution for something so crucial as end washing in a healthcare setting, you wonder like, wow, if none of this was thought of, if nobody thought that, human imperfection are going to make this not, not really work well. Nobody seems to be there to maintain, repair, replenish. Looks like nobody consulted anybody for the design of this. And then, um, you know, selecting products that are also uh, pleasant for the user, then you wonder like, okay, that's definitely not a safety, uh, a safety culture. So this is really something that we have to address like in our workplaces, like, if there's a lot resting on the shoulder of the employees, it's not going to be reliable. We know it. We're humans. We make mistakes all the time and we forget and all that. Plus, we need to have the belief that we're doing this for a good reason. And if that belief hasn't been well transmitted, we're just not going to do it. We have a mind of our own. And if we don't believe that uh, uh, hand hygiene is necessary when wearing glove, it's just not going to happen. And then if we don't consult the workers, then yeah, maybe we had as procurement a super great price on a new disinfectant, but if everybody hates it, they're not going to use it. And then after that, well, if we haven't got uh, together to make sure that our maintenance and replenishment of the supply, that sub process is there to support this all the time, and it's easy for people to flag these things, not going to happen either. And if we don't check, if nobody's uh, really looking that it's done, it's not on the radar of everybody because we're on to greater things, then uh, it's probably not going to get done. So as I said, you know, we absolutely need a way to measure the work, search the input of people, actively look for, you know, a confirmation, are we getting the results and all that? And if it's not, then we're improving. Well, all of this is, as we know, exactly the basis for a management system approach, whether it's ISO 9000, 14000, 
or 45,000, that's what it, it's there. So now let's see what the other thing that has been interesting is finally people talking about COVID-19 and OHS management systems. So can we say in all our organization that we manage COVID transmission as one of the hazard in our management system? Maybe not. So I recommend to read this article, but then just to um, remind everybody that, you know, so a management system approach is based on a very simple principle of the plan, do, check, act cycle from Deming, you know, originated in quality, but now it's all over all of the management system um, of ISO specifically, but others. And then, so in ISO 45001, well, you've got our good friend, the hierarchy of control, it's right there. So when you implement measures, you need to do them following the hierarchy of control. So it's all there for use. And then when you have an incident, when you notice that something is non-conforming, then you have to analyze like, well, did it happen because of improper implementation of the hierarchy of controls or what? So say there is a, um, a case in your facility, then definitely you need to look at was our hierarchy of control implemented correctly or not. So when looking at our whole, um, basically our, our, the system approach of, um, the management system approach, we've got, as we know, the plan. So plan is defining an overall strategy, assessing the risks, choosing the controls. So what is it? So you've got somebody in your organization that knows exactly what to do and defines the strategy. Um, the What we're looking at, okay, a lot of the things are uh, our legal requirements so we basically um, know where to look at and society has some expectation but in a management system approach you also need to have your worker participate in the process of defining your plan and then so when you assess the risk then you cannot put your best effort at, uh, uh, at everything you need to rank your effort based on the risk so for transmission of COVID is what are the positions which have greater probability because of greater interaction, more touching of objects with others? And which are the people that are really at risk where the consequence of hitting, of getting them in contact with the, the, the virus would create a very dramatic effect? So implementing the risk-based approach, of course, is necessary. And then, of course, higher risk uh, requires better controls following the hierarchy of controls. Okay. So in the do, you uh, implement the check you verify. So in the check, in anything that you do, you don't assume that people do it just because you said to do it. So that's the simple basic thing that we all know. We wouldn't try to be around 100 kilometers an hour on highways if there wasn't any police and to, uh, to make sure that this is happening. Same thing in the workplace. You need to measure and check if the plan that you've put together is implemented and also if that plan actually produces results because it's not because you had this great idea of doing it in a certain way that it's actually working. And then in the ACK, you make changes to your plan or you make changes to doing your plan, implementing it better. So you need those verification in order to be able to change your plan. And then it needs to be, you know, all under the umbrella of the leadership asking for, you know, results, uh, caring about this, making the, the wheel turn, the wheel of continuous improvement to ensure that there are some results. So for, um, for, for COVID in your workplace, you should wonder like is there really a plan does the leadership of your facility have a plan for everybody to follow have you uh, um, analyzed the uh, uh, the impacts for your workers but also for all of the input all of the people that come into your facility so even your contractors and suppliers have you taken care of them as well as your own employees have you put in place your measures your control with respect to a risk of a analysis or are you just spreading thin all over? 
have you been implementing your controls following the hierarchy of controls or have you been concentrating more on asking people to do things differently and counting on them wearing uh, PPEs and all that? And then are you doing your checks? Okay, so checks in health and safety, we're used to having at least monthly um, inspection of, uh, of the site. So have you changed your uh, in inspection checklist so that you would also look at the items that are now in your workplace to control COVID? And is once a month sufficient? You know, maybe it's something uh, that needs to do more frequently. Um, here in our jurisdiction, it actually is required to do it daily. Um, it's not a requirement in all the jurisdiction, but really, um, I think you have to find a, a right balance. Indeed, at some point when it's done daily, uh, sometimes it's actually just a check in the box. But definitively doing it once a month is not going to uh, show you things like uh, uh, empty, um, empty dispensers and people that have started to move again, the setup that, that has been done in the plant in order to uh, ensure the distancing. Um, and then, you know, is there an aggregate of all these results? Because um, a little bit like the example that I did for looking at the 24 causes of hand hygiene non-compliance, like is somebody looking at the big picture and wondering, what is the problem here? Is it because we put things in place, but we don't even consult the workers? Is that a common thread? Is it because of, um, we have no process for uh, the procurement of the things and replenishing? So what is the big picture? We need to aggregate things into processes. That's a management system approach. Just treating one problem at a time is basically chung, 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 you know, whacking them all all over, but not having something solid. And in fact, you know, the, the leadership should be asking for those questions. Like what is essentially the problem here of our approach not, uh, um, not working? And also don't forget, so maybe you're going to say, well, you know what, everything is okay in my plant. I've seen no clusters and all that. But at the end of the day, something doesn't lie. lie. There is 46% of the cases in our jurisdiction attributable to workplace. I bet you that it's something similar in all workplaces, just that the data is not available. So maybe you cannot find the problem specifically with your facility, but if you look at it, looking at do you have a system approach to it like that if you think that yes you do everything is following this okay you can you can go back to uh, to your work not uh, thinking for a bit about covid but if not if you don't do all of this it's uh, we know it's not going to work because this is the approach that works for managing all of the risk in uh, in your facilities and it's a proven approach okay so um you know, when we're looking at this, so don't forget, so we have to remember that in the spring, it was the public health authorities that came up with everything that we should do. And, uh, um, and, and, and then basically, when they did that, nothing was framed in the recognized health and safety management principle. So all of your doctors that you would hear in all of your jurisdiction, I bet you nobody was talking about a management system approach and a hierarchy of control. So it started that way. And then, um, and then the COVID-19, it affects everybody. So everybody in your facility uh, which knew about it and everybody sort of become an expert at this and how it should be managed. And it's great and we need uh, everybody, it affects everybody. But you know, when you're looking, for example, at other things like confined space entry and working at height and all that, not everybody thinks they're a specialist and of course not because uh, it is a, a niche. But then, you know, so we have a certain way of managing this. But so now that it is there and it's there to stay, um, so we need to take this back into what is the sound way of managing this in workplace. So it absolutely needs to be reintegrated in our overall uh, management system approach. And it's not too late to do it. So as you know, we are right into those those waves, so the second wave, the vaccine, it doesn't look like it's about to be hitting us um, uh, until the end of uh, 2021, generally uh, as a general, you know, enough for to get the herd immunity. So we have time, it's time to do it to reassess 
um, if we've really uh, re implemented our control following the hierarchy of control, if we should change the less effective one by more effective ones, we should make sure that we've included all the parties coming on our site and we should make sure that uh, maybe we need to give them help for reassessing their controls. Uh, we need to do it following the entire PDCA cycle. So uh, if you're not doing your checks, start to do it. If your top management is not asking for overall results to realign where they should put the effort, it's time to also involve them. So if they're not asking, you don't need to wait until they ask. You could provide the results and you know suggest a little bit that this is what uh, needs to be looking at. You need to uh, have your support processes working really well. So the maintenance, the procurement, uh, your folks in design, engineering, um, et cetera. And you need to get organized to implement all this in a more efficient fashion. So yes, you're probably doing today things like uh, paper forms and, um, and, and all kinds of other things that you're tracking, but is it taking you a lot of time and effort? So at this point, you would like to do all this because you know that you have to do it, but with less time and effort. And this is where technology comes in. So you need to execute. Once you have a good plan, you need technology to improve this. So I'm going to show you a few examples here um, following my two, two things, the hierarchy of control and the overall uh, management of, uh, of the different items. So of course, the one number one thing to, uh, to <laughs> that's the most efficient is doing exactly what I am doing right now is eliminating at the source, so doing working from home. Okay, that's excellent. But unfortunately, not everybody uh, can do this in their type of work. And the technology to do it, well, it's amazing. As you know, uh, the Zooms and the uh, Teams and all of this have become uh, better and better and better. So that's pretty cool. Um, but so other things, so for people that need to come, to come into your workplace, well, if you eliminate the people that have symptoms coming in your workplace, that also will be good. So how do you do it? Well, um, as you know, while measuring the temperature uh, is uh, would tell you if somebody has fever, but then of course it doesn't uh, really cover all the cases of the asymptomatic uh, people, but we are doing the daily self-screening, asking people if they have other symptoms, if they've been in contact with somebody. So this is often and still done. I'm surprised I went to a few uh, facilities and it, it was still a paper form. So I was surprised because uh, the person at the gate uh, is handing me a piece of paper, giving me a pencil that I need to touch. I need to fill it out and give back the pencil, give back the paper form. So you, when you think about that, it's a little bit uh, contrary to, uh, to the principle. So why are we not using um, basically our own uh, phones, which about everybody has by now? And then there's no exchange of, uh, of all this hand touching. And plus on top of that, then we've got the whole collection of the data, which then can be traceable. So today technology is there to collect and do all of this. And that can even be linked to the control access system of the company. So actually no human beings need to be involved. So it so happens that the company I work for indeed has a solution for this. And it just makes um, a lot of sense as opposed to shoveling paper around, creating bottlenecks at the gate and, and all of this. Um, then there's those things that are more like the engineering control. So continuing programs because they have been done you know some years ago I'm old enough to remember when we were doing a lot of energy efficiency and replacing all the uh, light interrupter with movement switch and uh, ambient light um, and things like that well it's time to put this back and then um, and then think about everything that we need to touch in a facility and use technology hardware exists right now to be doing this and don't forget simple things as just putting a, 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 basically a piece of steel at the bottom of the, of the door to be able to open a door, leaving a washroom with your foot. That's pretty simple, cheap, yet quite effective in removing another uh, piece uh, to, um, of, of something to touch. 
Now, there's been other things. Uh, so companies have developed more fancy things like a detector to know when you're getting closer in the bubble of two meter of somebody else. So uh, these things exist. And if in your facility, there's a lot of crossing of the people, maybe uh, it could be useful. And when trying to trace back who has been in close contact with somebody else, it can also uh, help you find this, uh, this data. And also in a way that is very secure in terms of of protecting the confidential information. So some governments have put uh, have put out some apps, but there was so much debate in society about protection of personal data that um, it's not clear if it's been very well uh, well distributed in the population because of all of this. But if a company has its own system and it's to wear only during work and there's absolutely no other data, maybe it's a solution. But so, and if we're looking at our, basically our PDCA managing of it. So as you know, you know, when, when, when uh, implementing the plan, you need people to know well and you need to create the belief. So to create the belief, education always help and to uh, disseminate your uh, your rules in your facility well of course as you know the e-learning is something that uh, has exploded during the pandemic so uh, having people stand up in a class all together uh, that's not going to happen anymore so that's uh, very practical and indeed for distributing the knowledge on COVID essential so um, also this uh, technology exists for that then as I had mentioned, in a management system approach, you also consider all the external parties. So if they have an impact, so all of your contractors, suppliers, everybody coming on your site, they have their own activities. So they have a little bubble within your big bubble. Uh, do they know exactly in their bubble how to well manage COVID transmission? If you don't ask, you will not know. So you can ask in your qualification of your contractors and suppliers to see how they manage and assess if it's uh, going to be strong or not. Um, then finally, um, you know, controls, you can put them in a generalized fashion, but as you're doing special project, you are in a special context, you can also uh, in your work permit, uh, make sure that you've really accounted for that risk. So when you do a work permit for work, you're looking at hazards for uh, working at height, confined space and all that. But what about the hazard of maybe an increased uh, probability of transmission of COVID? You need to look at this specifically and you can do that. And then finally, as I mentioned, plan, do, check, act. The check is important. If you don't look at your controls being implemented or not, your controls being effective or not, don't do wishful thinking that indeed there are. So um, the checks are important. And then the check, don't forget, it's not just one check at a time. It's also consolidating the result and finding the trends. What is wrong? Is it my procurement process that is wrong? Is it my design process that is wrong? Is it because the belief is not there for my employee? You only get that when you aggregate data. If you start doing this with papers all over the place, good luck with this. Um, and then finally, you want the act part. And the act part, you need to feed data to your top management. You want them to do data-driven decision-making, DDM, DDDM, my favorite. But so they need to adjust the plan, but just not with what they read in the newspaper, specifically for your facility. What goes well, what doesn't go well, what's the feedback? And, and then again, you need to organize your leadership so that they can take those right decisions. So um, those things that I showed that we do at, uh, at Cognibox, we've put them all together in a, in a Cognisafe uh, package. So you've got all the modules to integrate um, uh, all of these checks. Uh, and you can basically do all of those elements that are important. So don't forget, it's when you're past just doing uh, implementing the health measure, but when you're kind of checking that everything works and tying everything together. So my conclusion for today, um, is that really um, you need the management system approach to have a comprehensive, effective, sustained way of managing um, your hazards. The COVID one is, is one. It's a biological hazard and it's a proven uh, method to be effective, comprehensive, sustained. So integrate COVID um, con control in it. 
Um, if you haven't really put together your approach in an occupational health and safety management system before, um, if, if you have one already, yes, you, you, uh, you uh, input it, but if you don't, that's what I meant. Well, it's a good opportunity to try to develop it. And then everybody around you in your facility will be able to sort of see, oh, okay, this is how it works. Because don't forget, COVID, it's creating a lot of headache for everybody, but in fact, it's a sort of a relatively simple thing. So everybody will be able to see it and then be convinced, and then you can implement it to other a big risk that you have in your um, in your facility. Um, then you know devising your system on paper is one thing, but then executing it consistently across all affected parties, it requires time and effort. So using digital technology, it's to save you time, and it's to get it's to get a chance that it's really going to work it's going to save you time and also you know it it uh, it collates the data and you can see where you're going so one day so maybe I'll do a webinar in 2022 we'll talk about uh, post covid where we're at um, but then you know you look at this and it's an opportunity to say hey the complete management system approach has helped me or not for uh, for COVID and hopefully the answer will be yes and then so you could say well okay why don't I use this for my all my high risk in my organization so confined space working at height and all that and when we look at this so me from where I'm standing at Cognibox we still see that most of uh, of the large hiring uh, organization look at just managing their high risk with pre-qualification of their contractors and checking what uh, their workers have as training. Well, this if you learn one thing about the COVID pandemic here in regards to the management system approach, you can see how having just implemented controls and not making them fit in a framework of plan, do, check, act is not producing the results that are really uh, showing that we've got this uh, totally under control. So it should also give you a cue that if you've stopped your management um, at pre-qualification and checking at what employees has, have for training, it's also never going to get you um, the, the perfect result that, uh, that need to happen. Um, so, um, so hopefully you, you, uh, you, get, you get this, you can think about that and practice on, um, on managing the COVID risk. And uh, with this, George, I am finished. Uh, if there was any questions? Thank, thank you, Anne Sophie. Thank you for uh, your um, webinar and the insights. So basically, what you're just saying is simple prevention and simple plan could help us go through this crisis because at the end, there's no magic or there's no one solution. It's uh, uh, it's a combination of many little prevention that could help us at least not have a lockdown and continue to operate until this crisis is over. So uh, this is what I actually, you know, hear from your, your uh, from your webinars, and I hope that uh, you know everyone else see the same thing because it's a collective work for everyone to contribute in order for us to continue, you know, to continue to operate and uh, and uh, somehow uh, continue working. Um, any question? We have uh, some uh, time left. You guys are more than welcome to send the question by chat. I think I can see the chats here. If there's any question, please don't hesitate uh, to send uh, send us any question for Anne Sophie. If not, uh, thank you and uh, continue to be safe.